evening, Noah and I will be doing. Noah will be doing most of the talking. I just will be doing a few of the slides. Don't worry, I don't know. But the topic will be factorization, so it's mainly making sure how you actually can do efficient um, matrix operations so that you actually can build like efficient simulations doing like good AI related work and then therefore we're going to talk a little bit what we're doing there under the hood and then like Noah is a physics student he also was two times a co-op student for me when I was working at Martin and then yeah and also was used to be working at Martin but currently I'm just off for a month because I'm heading off in a month to California because I will be working at Facebook uh, so I'm going to start off by asking uh, how many people know what factorization is for array programming? Not as many as I thought. Cool. How many people know what linear algebra is or have done linear algebra? Alright, so you basically know what factorization is. Um, essentially what factorization does is it takes your for loops and your inefficiencies and gets rid of them um, by using essentially a linear algebra abstraction uh, in your code. Um, so this is going to be implemented in, in a lot of different ways, but I'll go over some of those. Um, but for loops don't have to be that bad. Um, but I think we've all found ourselves in, in a situation where we've written a quick application, a method, a uh, script, and you end up with three or four minutes of for loops, and you kind of look at your code and you go, something's got to be done here. Um, so the purpose of this presentation isn't necessarily to teach factorization, um, but it's kind of just to explore the technique as a whole, um, explore how it's implemented at the high level, at the low level, and then provide some examples uh, from my work, from Mary's work, and just some different. Uh, so an overview of the presentation, just quickly, we're going to start under the hood. Uh, we're going to look at glass, which I'll explain in a little bit. Um, I don't have any C logic in there, but Glass is written partly in C, so we'll call it C logic. Um, Mary will present uh, sparse Glass exploration. Um, I'll talk about Atlas. Uh, we'll go over NumPy data structures and operations a little bit, but I'm pretty sure a lot of people know what that is. We won't go too in depth. Uh, and then we'll take a look at Intel MKL uh, and the Intel distribution for Python. And then we'll go into some examples. Uh, Mary's going to present numerical modeling. Uh, as well as implementing collaborative filtering for the SQL. Um, and then I'm going to go over a little bit of quantum information processing uh, and the mapped in data mark uh, project that I was a part of at my last term. And then just some conclusions, recommendations, and takeaways um, from my exploration of the talk. So we're going to dive on the hood. Not too technical, it's not too bad. Um, so essentially, the last is the low-level functionality for all linear algebra uh, functions on your computer. Um, so it provides uh, scalar multiplication, vector addition, matrix multiplication, um, basically anything that you can do at basic linear algebra, it's available through Glass. Um, it was developed a long time ago, well, for me at least in 1979, um, and it's written in Fortran uh, and partly in C. Um, I won't go over the code because I don't know how to write in either of those languages and I can't answer questions either. So uh, we'll kind of move on. Uh, Glass has three levels. Uh, level one is vector addition of subtra subtraction, dot products, vector norms, uh, basically just vector operations. Um, and it has O n operation time. Uh, so the size of your data is the order of uh, the operation time. Uh, level two is matrix vector operations. Uh, so that could be matrix, matrix vector uh, multiplication, um, and its operation time is order n squared. And then level three is matrix matrix op uh, operations. Uh, so this could be matrix multiplication, this could be uh, inverting a matrix, transposing a matrix, taking permission conjugate, um, and this is on order n cubed. Uh, so Mary's going to introduce sparse glass. Um, and it's just a little bit different, but uh, has some pretty important points. So what you then actually also will see, for example, if engineers do like mo a modeling of, of physical phenomena, phenomena, then you have a lot of times like differential equations or partial differential equations. What that is actually happening is all the matrices that you have there might have like lots and lots of zeros. 
So you that, that actually don't want to store your zeros, you only want to store like the non-zero elements and therefore it's like also that you will have spark plus. And then you always will have two parts actually. You first always will need to start building up your matrix, what you most of the times actually will be do in like a coordinate form format. <coughs> and what it actually will be saying is, this is like my row index, this is my column index, and this is the non-zero value. And so in that way, you first are converting in that way your uh, matrix. The challenge is it's not easy to do like, for example, all those matrix vector uh, multiplications. So what you then actually will be doing once you have actually read in the matrix, you will be converting it to what you, for example, call like a compressed sparse row or a compressed sparse column. So what actually will allow you to easily know like in this row, you have all these different uh, non-zero values, or if you have compressed sparse color format, that you easily can know, okay, these are all the different uh, values that are available in this column. What you then also have, which is, for example, the diagonal format, if you actually have a matrix which only has like non-zero values on, their, on your di di diagonal, then you only just will say like, these are the non-zero values on the di diagonal, and again, you will be able to actually compress a lot of the elements that you have available. And once you have like uh, converted the matrices in these formats, you have them available again, like last routines. So, so you have a sparse dot product, you can have factor updates, sparse matrix factor multiplications, and then also that you can actually solve, you can solve all the different types. Of equations. Uh, so the next uh, piece of the puzzle here, we're kind of building up uh, right from the bottom, uh, is Atlas. And Atlas stands for Automatically Tuned Linear Algebra Software. Um, and it's an up-to-date and, and it's still currently being updated and developed. Um, and it's just a BLAST optimization. Um, so it optimizes BLAST at all three of those levels that I mentioned before. Um, but some levels uh, can be optimized a little more than others. Um, so you can imagine level three blasts where you have order and cubed operations. Uh, you're gonna have a lot more room to optimize and utilize the parallelization that you can get from uh, your CPU. Um, Atlas is, is a pretty de facto optimization on top of blasts. Uh, you do find it in a lot of machines kind of now. Um, and it kind of provides the benchmark when you're comparing it to the other optimization libraries. Um, there's a, a billion different ones I can go over them, but uh, you know, just for the purposes of the presentation, we'll stick to a, a couple here. Um, this is used by uh, languages like MATLAB, Mathematica, NumPy, uh, and Octave, which is just crappier than MATLAB. Um, and essentially, um, it's just a, a mathematical programming languages. Uh, they use Atlas uh, to do some optimization on the back end. Next uh, kind of optimization uh, library we want to take a look at is uh, Intel MKL. Uh, it stands for Math Kernel Library. Uh, obviously, it's implemented by Intel, and of course, they've optimized it for Intel processors. If you try and do this with an AMD processor, it's going to go all the way back down to its lowest level optimization, and you're not going to really get that. Um, so this isn't something you can just throw around on any machine, but chances are you're running an Intel processor, so you should. Um, so again, it provides optimizations all, through, all the way through levels one to three, um, and it also includes a, a bit more functionality uh, on top of the linear algebra, including past Fourier transforms, uh, vector math, um, and some random number generation as well. Uh, so all pretty computationally heavy problems on the back end, um, but you can optimize it with Intel and Kato. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about NumPy, uh, and like I said, NumPy is pretty packed, a lot of people know what it is. Um, but I like to talk about it because everybody uses it, so it's a good rule. Um, it's a core scientific and numeric Python package. Uh, it's the basis for sci-fi, and it's kind of in a lot of different libraries for scientific computing. Um, the basis of NumPy and kind of the uh, big claim to fame is the ND array. 
It's an array-like object, but you can store multi-dimensional array data in there um, of arbitrary data types. Uh, so that's a very powerful tool. You can use it as a storage device, as a computation device. You can use it for populations. Um, it's very flexible. Um, so the way that NumPy uses all of the previously set libraries um, is it maps its linear algebra functions back to either BLAST or ATLAS or Intel MKL or whatever you've got running in the back. So when you do a, a NumPy method on its array, for example, you do NumPy dot product, uh, it'll go all the way back to the glass level one and do a dot product uh, up to a rate. So now we'll go from uh, optimizing all the way up at the NumPy level. Um, so you can install and run NumPy distributions, and this is something that was new to me, um, on all of these different glass libraries. Um, chances are, if you're not doing anything super heavy, you probably won't need to do this. Um, but it is good to know that it's there in case you do. Um, and sometimes if you're anticipating a big speed up from using NumPy and you don't get it, you may be running the improper class library on the back. Um, one other component that you can add to your stack uh, is called the Intel distribution for Python. Um, and it's a full-fledged Python distribution implemented by, uh, implemented by Intel, and again, on Intel processors. Yeah. Do you know uh, Google uh, TensorFlow processors? Are they, uh, do you know what they are using? Because I understand they, all, they get uh, like super performance for uh, machine learning operations. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what's on the back end of TensorFlow um, without taking a look into it. I know that sometimes you can go from the CPU and insert into your GPU to kind of boost things up. Um, but I don't know exactly what TensorFlow uses on the back end, but if somebody does. But they also have like those optimized blast libraries in the back as well. Just like you can run really in parallel, which is this kind of those GPUs. But the main important thing that indeed is that your code also needs to be written in a way that it can be parallelized in a good way. Because again, if you would be there doing like all your forums and everything, it would be slow, but it's written in a way that it is like efficient and that it can be really well parallelized. And then a lot of optimizations can also be done by the code. And then you can flow it back to the Yeah. Yeah. And but yeah, but again, yeah. And you also have like those operations again, like which are being used, but it's yeah, the, the reason I'm asking is because I've seen the uh, uh, because uh, machine learning uh, uh, tasks are very uh, like CPU or GPU intensive, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is this trend to develop customized hardware, like yeah. TPU, Google TensorFlow processor is an example, yeah? yeah? So then the question is, can they use the same libraries or once you customize the hardware, you need to develop different software for vectorization, yeah, to, to get the performance? I see. Um, if I was to hazard a guess, I would think um, you could use the lower level uh, linear algebra subprograms like GLASS or LAPAC, um, but as soon as you get into Intel and KL, uh, where it's optimized just specifically for Intel, if it doesn't see Intel on the back end, then it's going to say, let's just go back to the start and be slow. So um, I'm assuming if you get that deep into it, you would be um, covering your optimization from a hardware level instead of the software level. Um, but I imagine you can only really go much above glass after that. But that's just a guess. Um, so Intel provides some cool graphs. Um, and this is all run on their end, so I imagine they've done, uh, done their homework. Um, what you see on the graph here on the y-axis is percentage efficiency when compared to native code. Um, and native code is writing the exact same functions, but in pure C. Um, so basically, it's as low level as you can get for the machine language. Um, in the blue, you have the Intel distribution for Python. Um, and in gray, you just have regular Python. And as you can see, stock Python never really quite reaches 100% efficiency. Um, 
But in some cases, Intel distribution surpasses 100%. Um, and in all of these linear algebra functions at the bottom, um, it's basically reaching 100%. Um, one kind of cool thing to note about this graph, um, if you see this uh, side pi lin algebra determinant, your efficiency boost, I would guess, is about 10%. Um, and that's going to be a level one or two glass operation. Whereas if you go and you take a look at side pi lin algebra eigenvalue, which would be a higher level of glass operation, you're seeing a lot more optimization. So that just kind of goes to show how um, you know, higher order operations are uh, optimized a little bit easier um, using these uh, efficiency tools. Uh, so we're going to get into applications. Uh, Mary's going to present a uh, numerical model, um, and uh, then we'll get into uh, collaborative filtering, and then we'll get into some quantum stuff, and then we'll go to Mapton, and then we'll uh, get your first question done. So this is kind of mostly like the way it used to work when I was doing my master thesis. So I was part of the numerical simulation group. So we were like helping solve other departments who were like modeling, for example, either Antalya problems or like uh, the decay of fruit or for example, like fibers. So they had like either a lot of differential equations or integral equations. So they had a lot of big matrices the code was not always written in an efficient way, and then they came to our group, and then we were like master students were helping out to speed up their code. So strategies that you then kind of always had, like in case you had they, they had implemented a lot of differential <coughs> equations, you would be looking how to you could use sparse glass to see, for example, compress all the matrices that were building up because most of the time it would mean that they was just storing a lot of zeros, which doesn't make any sense. So when you are using in that way like efficient make a matrix storage format is helping you out what you indeed can do next is for example if you're solving systems of equations, you probably don't always need a direct method. An iterative method actually also can help out. What you then have is that you just mainly need a lot of efficient matrix vector products where the blast again is helping you out. But you sometimes have is that actually you still need a lot of iterations before you get a good solution. So in that case, you have things that are actually called like preconditioners. If you can get like the eigenvalues of your matrix a bit better, then again, you need to have less iterations. You can speed things up. So that were kind of things that we were looking up. And then also what we noticed, like when I was doing my master thesis at a group, the thesis student before me, she actually got then the most optimizations actually just by using Atlas. So what actually meant, make sure you have to optimize libraries. And in that way, you can actually just speed up a lot of, lot of the calculations. And then afterwards, it only makes sense actually to do more like, um, optimizations of your algorithm. And then an important thing is always, if you have like your formulas, always try to stay as close as possible to your formulas. Don't be tempted to like, just write out the formulas and everything because you're always going to end up a bit slower. And that's actually also one example what I would want to get here. Like one of the previous companies that I worked at they bought like a company, and that company had like a tool what used collaborative filtering. And actually, the way it was implemented was you had like nicely all the formulas, which at the moment when I first saw the code were not available to me. So you had like a big long list of SQL codes, and then there was like not a developer who like re-implemented the code, so, and I needed to see whether the original code and the new code were doing the same thing, which is kind of challenging if you have like lots and lots of different um, computations that are going on. And therefore, like, you end up having actually a few problems. And it was just also really hard to really see with all the code that it actually was like, originally just like some matrix vector products and everything. 
And then eventually, I got back, got back at the original code, and if you then actually were just implementing it in Python, it was just something like 15 to 20 lines, which also just made it much more easy readable, and it was also like 20 to 50 times faster than the original code. So therefore, it's, it's just sometimes easier to have to do the formulas available. Cool. Now, you know, let's go further to the quantum process. So that's Richard Feynman. Um, and Richard Feynman was a really great physicist. Um, but the thing with him is he was very cynical. Um, and he was very humble. He liked to tell everybody that he didn't understand quantum when he was truly the one that was teaching it. Um, so this quote's kind of cool. Um, he said, nature is a classical gamut. And if you want to make a simulation of nature, you better make it quantum mechanical. And by golly, it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look so easy. Um, and he's right. Um, at the core is, is quantum mechanics, and that's how physics works. Um, but a lot of the time, you don't really need it to simulate nature. Um, but he wanted to. Um, and that's what we're trying to do with quantum information processing um, and improving computation kind of at the same time. Um, so the four questions of quantum info processing uh, at its very basic level um, is what is it? What is quantum information? Um, what can you retrieve from a quantum state? Uh, what kind of information can you keep? What kind of information is important? Um, then what can we do with that quantum information? How can we implement it in computing architecture? How can we use it to solve algorithms, solve problems? Um, the next question is, can we build a physical device, um, like you see on the right hand side there, um, that implements these proposed algorithms? So can we move on to uh, something physical uh, that are implementing these? Um, and the last question is, can we make these devices practical and efficient? Um, the picture on the left there, it's kind of blurry actually, that big hairball mess of things. Uh, that's not practical and efficient, uh, so we're not quite there yet. Um, but on the right hand side, you have Google's Sycamore 54 qubit chip. Uh, that's the chip that they use to uh, demonstrate quantum supremacy. And if you're from IBM, you'll we'll probably say that. Uh, um, and it's not actually 54 qubits, it's 53, because one of them broke. Um, it's still working. So uh, you can read that paper. Um, it's pretty easy to find, it's a big paper. Um, and it's very accessible too, if you, even if you have no quantum background, it's a, it's a pretty accessible paper. Um, and part of this development process of quantum information devices um, is simulating it and trying to figure out how they're gonna work before you actually build them. Um, so as you can imagine, that's just really expensive. Um, so you do that on a classical computer, so we don't actually have quantum computers yet, we're trying to build one. Um, so that's basically just writing linear algebra uh, in regular computers. Uh, so quantum gates are part of quantum computation, as regular gates are in normal computation. Um, it starts with quantum analogs of your regular classical gates, the AND gate, the OR gate, uh, C not gate. Um, but they're applied to quantum states instead of bits. Um, they function essentially the same way, um, but they're just in a, a quantum state. You can move on and pass that into quantum gates that aren't classical, and that's where you start getting quantum, quantum computation uh, efficiency, and you start getting uh, the big speed ups. Um, quantum gates are often represented in different, different ways. Uh, that uh, notation is pronounced bracket. It's supposed to look like bracket because it's just brackets. Um, it could be symbolized in quantum circuit notation or in uh, vector matrix notation as well. Um, and these gates are, are simulated classically, like I said before, uh, to make sure that you know uh, what your algorithm and your circuit is going to do before. So we'll start off with the simple gate, uh, the not gate. Um, as you can see, you have two states up at the top. You have the zero state and the one state. Uh, it's a one zero and zero one vector. And what the not gate does is it takes your zero state and moves it into the one state, just as the classical not gate turns a zero into a one, and a one into a zero, it works the exact same way, just with quantum states. Um, up at the top right there, you can see the different notations. Uh, the first part after the equal sign there is two outer products, so you have a bra and a cat, or a bra and a cat and a bra, um, that equals your uh, matrix that you're implementing. And then when you're writing a quantum circuit, your not gate is represented by a circle with a cross in the middle. And you can simulate this classically, just by this quick little function here. Um, in Python, you write a NumPy matrix, 0, 1, 1, 0, and then you return the dot product 
uh, the input state with your not gate and what you get out is the not gate uh, applied to your input state. So this one's kind of boring, but the cool one is next. This is a Hadamard gate. Um, and a Hadamard gate is kind of the first more fundamental quantum gate that doesn't have a classical analog. Um, you can see the two representations up at the top there. Uh, you have a big H in your circuit. It's pretty indicative of what it is. Uh, you have your matrix there, 1 over root 2 times your matrix. And what the Hadamard gate does is up at the top right there, you start off with a zero state. And what you get out of it is a zero and a one state superposition. So you have a quantum state that is now basically zero and one at the same time. And this is where the quantum starts to get cool. Um, if you were to measure the first state, you're going to get zero all the time. If you're going to measure the second state, you'll get either zero or one 50 bit. Um, so essentially, you lose the information from the original input state. Um, so the how to mark gate is cool. Um, because of these reasons. Uh, and if you use it in conjunction with other gates, you can do all sorts of kind of cool stuff. Um, you can create Bell states, uh, which is a quantum state that's at the cornerstone of quantum key distribution, uh, quantum teleportation and entanglement, and all those cool things. Um, and the nice thing about the Heimar gate, too, and, and most quantum gates, is that they're unitary and permission. So if you apply two of these H gates back to back, HH, your zero would go in and then you'd get a zero back here. So the way that that works is that it's reversible. So you have reversible computing, which is a, a big thing that quantum uh, can introduce. All that being said, uh, that's how you implement it in Python. Again, it's just a numpy matrix dotted with your input state. Um, so if you had a quantum circuit that you wanted to build and you threw together a whole bunch of Hadamard and not gates, and, and uh, you could just write a bunch of these functions in a class. Uh, call it quantum circuit, and then just create a quantum circuit um, classically. Now, it's not going to be a quantum computer, obviously, um, but it's going to show you what your quantum circuit will do to an input state. Um, as you can imagine, uh, this is just one qubit. If you get up to 54, you're going to have an enormous amount of elements in your matrices, and you're going to have enormous vectors. And NumPy is not going to suffice. Uh, so you're going to have to start using supercomputers, a lot of advanced techniques, um, but we won't go there. Uh, the point is, you can take a quantum gate and basically write one in NumPy. Excuse me, is it connected to a character who is either dead or alive? <laughs> physical? Yeah, I mean, you can call superposition that. It's kind of like um, <clears throat> you're in zero and one until you look at it, and then you figure out what it is. But then the problem is, once you look at it, now it's, if you look at it at, through the zero scope, now your state is zero, and you lose that kind of cool superposition. So you can think of it like that, as you have a zero and a one, you don't really know until you perform some yeah. Any other questions? I thought one might be the one <laughs> that might uh, spur a few questions. So what yeah, what is the other. reason of the square of two? I've seen it in previous slides. In both situations, you have the square of two. Yeah, so the one over root two is the normalization. Uh, so it's a normalization of the matrix so that you have all of your matrices and vectors in a normalized state, and you don't get any funny uh, multiplications in there. It's, everything's just ones and zeros. And, and that's like that. yeah. um, could you give some hints on how you would uh, scale up to multitude systems? Because, like in Silicon, you only have to yeah, um, I think at that point, if you have 10 or 20 qubits, 10 maybe, but 20 would probably surpass your regular last implementations uh, because you're getting into, I believe your matrix is going to scale up as 2 to the n, so you're going to get 2 to the 20, which is a very large number. Um, so. You could probably, it, it really depends on the, the limits of your processor. Um, I imagine 10 wouldn't be that big of a deal, but it would still start getting a little hairy. Um, and then you could kind of skip NumPy and go into C if you wanted to, um, and start working with uh, GPUs or working with custom hardware. Um, but yeah, definitely 20 qubit states, you would have to go to a supercomputer or some sort.
last application I'll talk about quickly is DataMart. Uh, DataMart was uh, a project I worked at, uh, I implemented at Mapton. Um, and essentially it was a collection of previously siloed data that was around on other different teams. Um, and this data was originally stored in uh, a NoSQL database. Uh, so we were having troubles doing uh, the SQL operations that we wanted to do on um, So we built uh, an ETL, uh, an extract transfer load pipeline, uh, to extract the data from the APIs and databases on the teams, uh, transform that data into something that Postgres will eat, and then we loaded it into Postgres. Um, the purpose of this pipeline was to basically take uh, daily aggregated data and push it all into one spot, data mark, uh, on a weekly basis so we could run reports um, and run uh, calculations on it to kind of see how our data is progressing. Um, the new data format that we put into place uh, allowed for a lot easier aggregation and extraction uh, from Postgres and allowed for easier reporting and scripting uh, on the other side of data. Um, and then vectorized uh, operations kind of came into play in the transformation stage uh, where we were taking a large data set uh, and performing functions on uh, multiple pieces of that data set at the same time. So I could have used loops, but it would have been really slow, because so as you can imagine, we need data, this is a lot of data. Um, and vectorized operations also came in when we were doing scripting. Uh, so we uh, you know, implemented uh, some statistical models, we took a look at some of the stats of the data, and, uh, and mode, things like that, very simple. Um, but again, large data set, but we could apply it kind of all at once uh, with these vectorized techniques. Uh, so part of my vectorization exploration was a speed test, because I wanted to prove this to myself. Um, I wanted to see how fast is a vectorized implementation, especially the way that we were implementing it uh, as compared to before. Uh, the way that I did this is I created a dummy housing database, uh, where you start off with a house and a house price, it started very cheap, and got to probably average around here. Um, and I wanted to compute the down payment, uh, which would be uh, 20%, uh, very simple. Uh, the first way that I did this is with a for loop, and I started with a hash map or a dictionary of a house ID map to a house price. Um, and I iterated and I iterated and I calculated the down payment, and I timed it to see how long it would take uh, to do all those calculations on the million years. Um, then um, what I did is I used a pandas data frame. Uh, pandas data frames are essentially uh, beyond the database abstraction of the database, um, and they implement NumPy arrays. And I performed essentially a scalar multiplication of 0.2 on the entire house price column, uh, and put that into the down payment column. Uh, so I timed it to make sure that it was fair, uh, made sure there was no other processes running, and made sure it was as fair as I could make it. Um, and the results of this, uh, for 10 trials uh, and averaging them. For loop took about 0.546 seconds, and Pandas did it in 0.017, uh, which is a 32 times speed up uh, for a million rows of data. Um, and a million rows of data is relatively large, but a scale and multiplication of a million row vector is pretty simple, um, and it's obviously very quick. Uh, so this kind of just proved to me that the, what we were doing uh, at Mapton with vectorization was going to work. Uh, so, just some quick conclusions. Uh, vectorization is very easily implemented using Python libraries. And I imagine if you're in another uh, you know, MATLAB or GNU Octave, you can do that to yourself. Um, <laughs> you can easily find ways to implement vectorization. It's not very hard to do. Um, NumPy is so readily available, it's in a ton of libraries. Uh, it's all well documented, and you can dig right down into the source code and figure out how they're doing it. Um, and you can look at the other libraries and see if they're doing it as well. Um, vectorization can dramatically increase the speed of numerical calculations on large data sets, as you saw with the speed test. Um, but sometimes that's not the case, and sometimes you don't get the speed up that you want. Um, and the reason for this is, you know, sometimes you have a small data set, 10 rows, for example, um, and it's already in a JSON dictionary, and you perform a for loop, and it works. But then you go and you put this in a pandas data frame, and you reorganize the data, and you do all the scale multiplication. And all of that takes time and effort on the development side, but it also takes time and effort by the computer to initialize all of those data structures. Um, 
So you really have to evaluate where vectorization is going to kind of come into your project. Um, but chances are, if you have a large data set um, and some foundational code, it's going to do you well. Uh, and then lastly, uh, implementing vectorization does require some data organization, uh, some exploration in the libraries. Uh, but the gains in speed uh, and code organization uh, definitely justify the effort. Um, speed is one thing. Speed is great, obviously. Um, but code organization can be a, a, obviously a huge thing. And when you are uh, you know, looking at a bunch of for loops that are implemented in your algebra functions, it's going to get kind of confusing kind of quick. Um, now, if you have very simple numpy methods applying those same functions, uh, it's going to be readable, it's going to be concise, um, and you're going to be using the latest technologies. And as your project evolves, um, the libraries will also evolve, and everything will kind of evolve as uh, one big vectorization family, uh, which is a good thing. So that's uh, about it. Question? Question. Thank you for the presentation. That's fantastic. Okay, good. Okay. So in some languages, all atomic types are vectors. Yeah. And so all of your examples were numerical. I wanted to ask, do you know if there are program libraries for characters or the different types that we can use? Yeah, so uh, essentially when you're using NumPy, because NumPy is arrays can store um, you know variables of any type or data data of any type, um, you can perform functions on those vectors of text, for example, floating point numbers, uh, you know, characters. Uh, you can perform functions in a vectorized way and still implement the same parallelization that you're trying to implement. Uh, so pandas actually has, a, it's basically called dot apply, and you can dot apply a function that you've written in Python to an entire column in the pandas data break, uh, regardless if it's numbers or text or anything. So if you want to display some text, you can do that. Yeah. Oh, uh, maybe it's a great place to Yeah, I, I don't specifically know. Um, all of the uh, libraries that I mentioned were CPU, um, but I imagine there are. Uh, I can't imagine nobody's done it before. Um, I think yeah, it's CUDA. Yeah, it's a CUDA. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's probably the same function, but optimized for it. GPU. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, thanks for answering that. So uh, in, in sort of the, in the C world or C++ or Java, you sort of have vectorization built in. Right? So yeah. there's, there's a lot of effort on the part of the compiler uh, you know, authors to, to actually do that. You know? So I, I still love the like, doubles. It sort of comes out as AVX by itself again. Right? Yeah. Uh, so have you sort of looked at that as a, you know, should I, should I just trust the translator or should I Call the library myself, or should I just handle it? You know, oh yeah, um, yeah. I guess I guess it depends on, on how deep you want to go and, and how expensive your problem is. Um, I've personally never gone really deeper than looking into Python's plugins to see. Um, but you know, you can clearly uh, do as, as much exploration as you want. Um, and all of these uh, programs and libraries are very well documented. They've been around for a while. Um, and if you really wanted to, and you didn't trust the person who wrote the compiler, you for sure could probably take a look into that. And um, you know, if you really were inclined, write your own uh, compiler that did, does it better. But, yeah. Sorry, a quick follow-up. Uh, so last, I guess part of the speed is actually the linear algebra optimization, right? Like, like, like a matrix matrix multiply isn't O N Q, it's O N two point seven eight because somebody sped it up a little bit. But there's also like how the data is then organized. So for example, you have, uh, it's certainly like for, from there you have like matrices or like sort column wise. And therefore like you need to make sure that if you're implementing your matrix vector multiplication that you're using column wise and not row wise because otherwise you're like completely slowing down. So that's all kind of the things that are being used and like caching and everything that is like really efficient that the 
that the for loop unrolling is being done. So that's actually what Atlas is doing is like doing like a lot of like calculations to make sure like that you know the correct parameters and that enables it like to have like fast calculations. Because if you would do like the experiment for, for yourself, for example, matrix vector, for like assume first that your matrix is like stored columnized versus rowized, you will see that depending on how you're storing it, it will be slowing down or speeding up. I think there's, so from what I've seen, I, I looked at the, the source code, I guess you would call it. Um, I don't think it's currently being updated or developed. There may be very small changes to it, um, but it's, you know, it comes pre-packed with all of the and, and you get them like the optimized, like what you have with until you're like the optimized version for like each processor. Right. So which it's sort of done after the fact. Yeah, so always make sure that you have like fast building blocks to do the calculations. Yeah. Are you aware of any recent reports of bugs in this uh, vectorization libraries? Because uh, let's say Blast is since 1970, so you have like 40 or 50 years of testing, yeah? So yeah. it's hard to imagine that you have a bug there, but compared to NumPy that's recently, even though NumPy sometimes calls Blast, but it has its own stuff. Mm -hmm. So are you aware of any reports of uh, recently bugs found in these libraries? Um, I haven't seen any myself when I'm using NumPy, but you could, uh, NumPy is on GitHub, so you can find all the issues that are uh, currently there, all the bug reports. Um, a buddy of mine actually found what he thought was a bug in, in NumPy um, and did a little bit of digging and found something that he had to kind of finag and make it work. Um, my uh, answer to that would be a lot of the main methods of dot product inverse, um, all of those have been well documented, tested, and thoroughly thought through. Um, but NumPy is constantly being developed, so I imagine some of the newer methods uh, especially in the unstable versions would be, um, may have some bugs in there. But you might have to do a little bit of digging in fancy stuff to find them because NumPy is pretty, uh, pretty robust. Um, oh, I, yeah. I, I know you mentioned uh, quantum yes. computing. I'm yeah. just curious, was that just kind of like a little tangent or does that have anything directly to do with, with, with these tools that you described? Uh, basically a tangent. Um, you can implement vectorization wherever linear algebra is, um, and you know these applications are everywhere, uh, and they're everywhere in physics. Even for example, you have condensed matter, uh, they're in optics, quantum optics, quantum whatever physics topic you're looking at, it's, it's all there. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a tangent. Now there are a lot of uh, Python libraries being developed for quantum simulation um, and quantum experimentation. Uh, I know of one that it's called Q codes. Um, it's nothing to do with vectorization, but it's essentially uh, developed by Microsoft to help uh, people in quantum research uh, speak to all the instruments that go into a quantum. Um, so yeah, it's a tangent in this case, uh, but I'm sure there's a quantum simulation Python library out there somewhere that uh, does a little bit more quantum than just the linear algorithm.